So let me actually just introduce myself. I'm um, Vikram Koka. I am an airflow committer. I'm also heading up engineering at Astronomer and uh, based out of uh, San Jose, California. Uh, definitely, please, this is going to be an interactive talk. So if you have comments at the end, please, please reach out. We'd love to hear from you. So today's talk, I'm actually here to make a case. And the case I'm trying to make is that uh, using data sets and micro pipelines would actually give you a lot better predictable performance, would make it easier to test DAGs and, micro, uh, and uh, overall in general, as well as uh, make it a lot easier to maintain and read DAGs as they basically grow over a period of time. This is, frankly, a lot of lessons applied uh, from learning of like, you know, software engineering and uh, applying them towards data engineering and actually DAG writing and pipeline writing. So this is very much as all such things go, uh, standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, a lot of this talk is actually inspired by design patterns from the Gang of Four. Uh, the, it's also based on refactoring from uh, Martin Fowler. And uh, I definitely give also uh, kudos towards Refactoring to Patterns, which is a book by Joshua, whose last name I can't pronounce, but I think Tatiana knows. And uh, this is really based on that particular approach towards applying to uh, data engineering and uh, writing pipelines. So with that said, the very similar things of actually applying towards you know, what standard patterns apply or exist for data integration. And uh, there's like you know, a few different data integration patterns over a period of time, uh, which have existed for like probably well over a decade. And uh, I am actually using the three of them because I think they're the most common data integration patterns which exist today, which people actually write with Airflow, are very common with pipelines and so on and so forth. Now again, you might actually have different examples or different patterns, which I would love to hear from you as well going forward. But the first three ones, which I think are actually super relevant and uh, from my conversations with, in, with many people, including some of the people in this room, are very first a migration pattern, which is almost the, and like, you know, most of us tend to think about ETL which is actually an implementation of this particular pattern of like, you know, taking data from a source system, doing some level of operations on it, and then basically turning this into some form of an external system or data representation. A second form, of, which is also a classic data integration pattern, is a broadcast, wherein one set of data is actually sent to many different consumers of this data, many different systems who actually use this particular data. One classic example is IoT data in kind of like a general sense, but there's, this pattern exists in any enterprise of any scale. Sales order data is basically one other example of this, which kind of goes into multiple systems kind of coming together, whether it is to tie together with marketing or with customers support or advertising and so on and so forth. The third pattern, which I think we see a lot with Airflow in, uh, at various stages, is basically an aggregation pattern of pulling together information from a variety of different sources, working on this and turning this into a consolidated data set. And that is uh, typically three of the most common patterns, which uh, at least I've seen, again, I'm very, very open to input of other data integration patterns, which people actually see overall. There's a couple of others which are very popular in the, in the industry and very well uh, known and nomenclature-wise, but I actually didn't use this for this particular example. Okay. So, Using a particular example to say, like, you know, how does this actually apply and uh, work together? This is an example of which I've actually used before. But the key thing which one comment I've actually heard, including from some of the people in this room, is like, you know, data sets and micro pipelines honestly are really good ideas. They'd have been really good to actually use if we had actually seen them when we initially started writing DAGs. But honestly, most software tends to grow over a period of time. And how do you actually adopt this? So a lot of this talk is really based on you know, refactoring towards patterns, refactoring DAGs towards particular patterns. And that's actually the theme of uh, this particular example as well. Most DAG authors I actually think, and I've actually noticed as well, tend to add tasks to existing DAGs. In a lot of cases, these tasks are added to existing task groups 
even within a particular DAG as well, because you tend to kind of process additional data files. One example here is for a financial services organization, happens to be a customer of Astronomer, and uh, who's, who's somebody who's actually been a customer, of, a customer for a while, so I'm actually intimately familiar with. They actually analyze a ton of data, a payment data coming in from a variety of different sources, credit card data, bank data, and so on and so forth. They actually aggregate this data using, in this case, uh, Snowflake. Uh, they basically do prediction algorithms using Spark and then they provide estimates for like you know financial results to be kind of fed and their customers are like you know hedge funds or investment banks and so on and so forth towards being able to make a larger predictions when they start off started off things are actually very good and that's actually true for most DAGs when you start off the, the performance is really predictable you know the data you basically know how everything works and everything actually really works on time and everything else the good thing however is good things grow for anything which actually has validity, people actually want to add more data, and that's actually a good problem to have. When you actually start adding more data, you kind of pull in more data from additional sources, additional aggregators, and additional payment systems. Typically, the most common thing we'd all do, and honestly, this is the same pattern with software, tend to add a new task to an existing task group and add this new task to pull in the data for like, you know, which could be significantly larger than any of the existing data sets, pull this data set together, and like, you know, saying, hey, I want to analyze additional data in this case, which could be a franchise, and uh, as things grow, performance slides. And generally, the first sign you actually know when there's a problem is when an SLA is missed, at best, right? Uh, the other case is basically tasks fail, DAGs, DAGs fail, and so on and so forth, and that's basically become the first sign of knowing a particular problem. Now, my plea, I, I think in this case, or my request is in this case, is to say use this as an opportunity to refactor, okay? And, I, and that's kind of the, the key premise which I'm actually putting forth here, which is that I do believe that data sets and the concept of micro pipelines are a way to refactor an existing DAG and an opportunity when there is a failure, that is the opportunity to actually refactor, again, pretty much the standard thing from like, you know, software engineering principles as applied to DAGs. Now, just to kind of go back towards, you know, definitions, what is a data set? A data set, we actually introduced this in Airflow 2.4, at this point in time is a logical abstraction of some data which may exist in some system. Typically it's a file or it's basically a database table. DAGs can now, since 2.4, be triggered as, as part of an update to a data set and this can kind of trigger further, uh, further DAGs and uh, further pipelines. Kind of defining a term which we call a micro pipeline which would process one or more input data sets and create one or more output data sets. And this is very similar to the concept of like, you know, having a module or a class as basically something which could be invoked independently together towards then basically building loosely coupled data pipelines. A couple of things we'd like to add, and these are going to be follow on proposals, is to actually add concrete representations of these data sets. One comment which I've actually heard saying, hey guys, data sets were nice to abstract, what the hell do we do with it? And like, you know, we need some actual concrete representations. The two concrete representations which we'd like to propose is really files, which are a logical abstraction on top of like, you know, any file, whether it is local or in a, a GCS cloud bucket or an S3 bucket or anything like that, and provides a consistent abstraction towards being able to deal with data files. The second and equally obvious representation of a data set to actually make, con to concretize is really a database table. Right? And this is actually, again, data, uh, data sets or types of like in you know, a database tables. Basically, we provide an abstraction and a consistent abstraction of like you know, any database table, whether it is like on Postgres or SQLite or like you know, any cloud data warehouse. And, and one key thing which we want to do is provide transfer operations and transformations between these kinds of data, data sets to actually go forward. Okay. Now, once we have these data set types, which actually represent concrete representation, which are concrete representations of data sets, then we start getting into these particular patterns. How would we actually use these data sets in a migration pattern? And I kind of actually going to try to walk through all three examples. And uh, it's not necessarily a, a quiz, but I do actually want to have feedback after this about like, you know, hey, is this the right representation? So. For a migration pattern, which is actually, frankly, one of the simplest and the starting points of like almost any DAG anybody actually writes with Airflow, right? You actually get data from a source system. Typically, it's an input file of some form, whether it is on S3 or like, you know, GCS bucket or someplace else. And then you actually process it. One 
second element of this talk, which I talked about, is also like you know, testability. And it's an urge core, uh, it is kind of an intent to kind of say, how do we actually incorporate better data quality checks as a consistent practice into writing DAGs on Airflow? One of, the, one of our intents as part of doing the setup and teardown AIP was to actually incorporate data quality checks as part of setup and teardown. There's a little bit of a debate on you know, how well does it actually apply in a teardown, and that is something which, honestly, Jed and I have actually discussed multiple times. Uh, but it is at least in setup, seems like the absolute logical place, uh, a part of our intent, was to incorporate a data quality check as part of a setup task, now that it's actually available. Because it is kind of a clearinghouse. I mean, you actually want to test the quality of the input data before you actually spend a lot of compute and infrastructure time on processing that data, which is going to, through the the rest of your pipeline. That is almost a standard practice, but we'd actually like to urge, and again, feedback is really appreciated as part of this, is to actually incorporate an input data quality check as part of a setup task is as part of your DAG going forward. What, what then the DAG structure in this particular pattern would actually look like for a migration pattern is that this would actually look like, you know, hey, there's a data quality check on the input. Then there is like, you know, typically a transformation or a cleansing, which is a core, which is a core task, which actually happens within the DAG itself. And then it creates a clean set of data to then basically for further processing. Uh, and the, the, uh, the pattern here is that there's a micro pipeline which implements the migration pattern, which sole responsibility is to cleanse the input data for then be able to kind of go forward in a migration pattern. Most of the times today, until this point in time, the way I'd have seen this is this is incorporated into one or more task groups as part of a much larger DAG, whereas actually implementing this as a micro pipeline, uh, the assertion or the hope is that this would be easier to maintain, easier to test, and builds better practices kind of going forward. The second key pattern, I'm actually going to change the order a little bit here, is the aggregation pattern, wherein it's, again, a very, very standard pattern. And this is kind of the reason for dynamic tasks, I think, which were I've completely lost track of when they were introduced now, uh, as part of like you know Airflow, wherein we introduce dynamic tasks to kind of go across a set of input files or like you know input tables towards then kind of collapse them into one consolidated data on which further operations could actually happen. Now the intent here is that typically that you actually the result of an aggregation pattern is actually a database table. It tends to be a fairly large database table. And then the one of the key properties of an aggregation pattern, or the result of an aggregation pattern, typically tends to be, hey, there is non-duplication, or the data is deduped at this particular form to kind of be a valid source for further data processing. There is certain additional checks which typically happen. But again, the key thing is that there is a validation test at the end of this particular aspect. Once all the data has actually been aggregated through this particular dynamic task or other pattern, and then there's a validation test. This data is then basically made available for further transformation or other operations kind of going forward. And uh, that is kind of like a you know, classic example of like another thing which could become a micro pipeline and providing this, this result data set for further analysis going forward. There's additional tests, which I think data quality checks, which people can put in. Uh, there's a certain level of discussion whether the, uh, the validation test should be part of a teardown or not. Uh, in this particular element, I've actually kind of said it, sh it is not part of a teardown because of certain implementation reasons with how we've actually defined teardown to be right now. But that is, again, a place for kind of feedback, which I would love to kind of see as well. The third element, the third pattern, is actually kind of harder, actually, with Airflow today. And, uh, but it is actually a very common pattern, wherein there's a broadcast. And this data, once it's actually made available, is uh, once this data is actually produced, there is like you know either a set of analysis actually being done. But this data is then broadcast to a multiple set of external customers, typically as a data product. Right? And uh, this pattern exists wherein Typically, when it, when it is a data product made, made available to external customers, this is put into like a cloud uh, storage bucket, set of different files. Each customer is picked up from there. But that's not always the case. Inside an enterprise, this actually becomes like in a database table or like in a, some other form, again, on a file. But then it is consumed by multiple other departments. Again, the sales order data is an example. And multiple other departments start consuming this data. The second pattern actually I think is harder, 
because then the, the consumers of this data typically come up with additional requirements and say, hey, we want to actually extend this data. And being able to do this in a, in a, data, in a correct data validation aspect then becomes basically a challenge as well. So one of the key things here, again, would basically urge is the validation test at the very end before the dispatch actually happens for the broadcast so that the validation and the schema can actually be published in a very consistent pattern for, for the broadcast uh, to actually happen. There's a few things which actually come in place here, which is how is the data to be broadcast, what is the, uh, the identifiers before the dispatch actually happens, and what kind of test to actually be done overall. Implementing these together, actually, for the previous, uh, previous model of the example DAG is actually relatively straightforward. If you look at the, the previous three task groups, they kind of actually fold relatively nicely into, uh, into these particular three different sets of actually patterns, which is typically like you know, the migration, then there's an aggregation, and then there's a broadcast pattern, and these actually apply. Now, if, this is based on an example pipeline, which I actually happen to know, but I would, again, love feedback about you know, how often does this happen and what variation and exceptions basically happen in real life in all of your particular use cases. In this case, from what we've seen, it's like you know, file data sets, migration pattern towards other files, an aggregation pattern putting stuff into data into Snowflake, performing a prediction analysis using Spark, creating the set of results for each particular uh, financial, uh, each particular company for which predictions are being created, and then creating the, the files which are actually broadcast to the customers who are consuming these particular predictions are the standard pattern which actually applies. The key advantage which I would say is once you actually create micro pipelines, the predictability of each pipeline is very, very well defined because you're not adding data to an existing pipeline, and therefore the predictability in this case, at least the ones which are already existing, continue to deliver at the same period in time uh, without actually having unexpected delays because somebody has added an extra task which takes much longer to a pre-existing task group which then kind of delays everything else. That is kind of like you know, the key element which I would kind of urge from a pipeline standpoint. The key thing which is, is really common in like, you know, data engineering, again, with software engineering, is addition of new tasks. And this provides resiliency from the perspective of like, you know, having to create like, you know, data, uh, having to kind of create and add uh, pipeline performance in a predictable aspect. That's pretty much everything I've said right now should be possible with Airflow today. I think the, the patterns are defined. To some extent, I don't think we've necessarily publicized them with, with everything else. Uh, the, the file and table data sets are stuff which we actually want to contribute uh, to the open source project. This is stuff which we've actually been working on as part of Astronomer. And uh, those are kind of like you know, the transformation across the common data sets. The one biggest ask I've actually heard uh, consistently probably over the last year is around uh, data sets and the, con the conceptual concept of data set sensors, which is, hey, data sets are actually updated outside of Airflow in a lot of cases today because of like, you know, hey, data getting published and uh, to, be, to be coming in on, like, for example, a GCS bucket or an S3 bucket, how Airflow needs to kind of automatically detect it. So what is the concept of like the effective equivalent of data set sensors, for lack of a better phrase, to actually be made available through Airflow, which another notion we have kind of talked about is polling of data set, uh, data set changes. This is, again, there is some open questions of how general do we actually make this over and beyond, like, you know, for general event-based kind of like, you know, monitoring, but at the very least, external polling of data set changes is something which we absolutely believe we need to work on. Part of the reason for holding off on the first part is that we need to actually have concrete types uh, to actually say, hey, what is an actually an S3 file, and therefore to be able to kind of then lead to that. So that is kind of the logical uh, reason of why we actually want to kind of propose that sequence of changes from that standpoint. The third element, really honestly, is the making it easier to refactor and maintain existing pipelines. A lot of this, honestly, I think is actually more patterns than necessarily code, per se, at this particular stage. Uh, but again, would uh, love to kind of see and hear perspectives on this one as well. So this is very much kind of like a certain amount of a plea for actually making uh, DAGs smaller and to be able to kind of have uh, very maintainable and distinct interfaces between DAGs. 
personally tend to believe that data sets actually are the equivalent of APIs uh, between pipelines and to be able to kind of actually refactor very large pipelines and very large DAGs towards effectively micro pipelines using data sets as these particular interface mechanisms. I actually also believe that data sets are a very potent mechanism for making pipelines uh, far more maintainable and readable for the person who has to go kind of edit them after you initially create them and uh, for, for this to happen rather than having to read for example, like uh, a DAG with 500 tasks and like you know maybe 20 task groups, and kind of say, hey, why is this kind of actually missing an SLA? Right. But having said that, would love to get perspectives. Would love to get uh, questions. As I said, I really wanted this to be interactive. I may not have left enough time for it to be interactive, but again. Okay, um, definitely have some time for questions, but at the same time, I have uh, two giveaways here uh, for questions that are going to be asked to Vikram, and the, the stipulation is you can't ask him a question like, what's your favorite color? So if you stump him, you get to pick one of these. Who has the first question? All kidding aside. No, not that, not that doesn't, not for the book in general. Uh, one of the challenges with that data set is it has to be created through a DAG. You could not externally create it. So one of, when we were trying to talk with customers on the usage of data sets to go adapt them, uh, many of, I think you covered it in one of those slides that many of them can be externally generated and most of them are externally generated and consumed externally while probably doing some form of load or copy or by direction on saying the other data integration patterns. My question to you is that out of those patterns, you kind of highlighted three of those primarily. One, are there options that you have also thought of to think or solve through Airflow those other two patterns? That's the first question. And the second question is if companies are just doing load versus doing extraction or transformation or not generating something intermediate for data sets to consume, how do you think micro pipelines can extend that architecture or principle? So uh, very much yes, bidirectional send is one of the patterns I deliberately did not cover in this case. Uh, I do think it actually applies very similarly as well because the same concept of like, you know, how do you actually test for it? definitely applies in that case. The second question which you had is on external generation. And that's honestly really what we wanted to cover with the data set sensors. Okay. Um, so the key part, which you're absolutely right, a lot of people have actually brought up saying, hey, if it is, a, if it is an enclosed ecosystem, everything being generated within Airflow and uh, stuff like that, it is data sets as they stand apply, but we need the external generation capabilities to be covered. And that's really the reason for data set effectively concept of like, you know, data set sensors. Thanks. Makes sense. Oh, I'm worried about his question. <laughs> Uh, who's next? Oh, you. That's okay. Hi. Oh, thanks for the talk. Oh, so the way you're describing data set here was mostly just a uh, fine line almost, but a data set as a concept sort of has a lot more metadata, for the lack of word, attached to it. What uh, do you envision the data set as a concept to evolve in that direction or? <coughs> So in this case, actually, I, you're absolutely right. I, I would actually say there's three concepts, though, which I didn't kind of drill into, but you're right. One concept is really that data sets in, for both files and tables would actually be Airflow compliant in the sense that they would use the Airflow hooks, for example, in actually how to access those particular files. So it is more than just a file name. It includes the access mechanism towards being able to get to that file. And that is the reason why I indicated that it was a stepping stone. Because to be able to kind of detect polling, right, you, you actually need to know, hey, how do I get to that file to know it changed? So one of the key reason for the data sets, I mean, there is a part which I kind of skipped over. It was there on the, is like, you know, the connection ID which kind of fits into the notion of like, you know, the airflow hook 
and like you know how you actually get to that file as well. So it actually does include the access mechanism. It, clearly, it is not a full-fledged provider, but it does include the access mechanism to get to that particular data set towards actually getting uh, getting there. There is additional elements which you can have. So it is more than just a file name. It is more than a URI. It includes the access mechanism. It includes the hooks. And it, therefore, it also fits into the overall security posture that Airflow has which is, I think, honestly, one of the big strengths that Airflow has. And therefore, we didn't want to kind of bypass that in any way, shape, or fashion. Uh, but I, I actually do know where you kind of get, there's additional stuff I can answer on the metadata stuff as well. But I do view that there is going to be more extensions we need to make over time. Uh, we have time for one more question. Okay. Hi. Um, so I guess an implication of this is you have many, many more decks. And I, this might be a bit of a loaded question, I think. But um, from a kind of monitoring perspective, do you feel like there's enough capability in the, in the UI that can give you that view ab above all of these decks so you really know what's happening at any one time? I actually do believe that a lot of the stuff which uh, Pierre and Brent and others have actually been working on in the UI over the last year has been fantastic. And I think they've been adding a lot of capabilities on filtering and monitoring. And uh, you're right, it is, uh, I think it's improved a lot. I do think it needs to improve further as well. But I do think that's really the right way for us to expand our flow towards covering a lot more cases and a lot more breadth for it to kind of go forward. I, I mean, it's part of my personal goal is to kind of like, you know, cover all possible data integration use cases. Uh, and I think that's part of our goal as Airflow as a community. Thank you.